and I had the feeling that it was inside inside of my brain and I couldn't reach it. It would just drive me nuts. And a few nights I would just stay in bed and cry because I didn't know what to do. Delia, how did you find carnivore? I guess the traditional way to answer this on this channel is there is a long story and short story, right? So, and I think um, most of people answer this question like that because nothing exists in isolation. So if you look at any behavior, if you look at any addiction, because we are possibly talking about carb addiction in here or any food addictions, they don't exist in isolation and any behavior change is quite difficult. And I work with that. I work with gambling addicts. So we talk a lot about change and how you change your behavior and what does it take. And I think when it comes to food behavior, it becomes even more tricky because food is so intricately kind of connected to society, to your beliefs, to how you grew up, to how you ex express your love how you show people your appreciation. It's really closely linked with your beliefs and political beliefs, as we know. So, and I think that's why it takes a long time to explain how we end up at this point, because you cannot really paint the full picture without bringing all that into equation. So I guess I will start with a short story, if that's okay. Uh, and my short story starts in 2020. That was during the events in the world, as we know, and uh, as probably every first person, I put on a little bit of weight, and I I never been massively overweight, and I never really had weight issues in a sense that I hear on this channel. My weight issue would be like putting half a stone because I really feel it. I'm um, 150, 168 tall and I'm about 58 kilograms, so any couple of pounds, I would feel it and I really don't like it. Um, so yeah, half a stone was a big deal for me. And I, I'm 59 tomorrow actually, so, uh, and I had a long life of trying different things, trying to lose weight and went through all the traditional things like cutting calories and restricting and all that stuff, which we all tried. And I think at the time I was looking for something which I haven't tried before. And I threw myself onto YouTube and I came across Dr. Jason Fang, who is a Canadian nephrologist. He has got his whole, whole school about intermittent fasting and he worked with people who's got diabetes and overweight. And he's got really interesting view on cancer, which I might talk about later. So, yeah, I came across Dr. Jason Fang, and he obviously talks about intermittent fasting. And when I started looking into that, I realized that I've been doing this all my life because I never liked eating breakfast. And despite of mainstream things saying breakfast is the most important thing in the world, which came from Kellogg's because they won't sell their whatever, rubbish, you know. And my mom always used to say to me, you need to eat breakfast, you need to eat breakfast. And whenever I tried it, when I was younger, I would listen to people, right? So I would try to eat breakfast. And then for the rest of the day, my appetite was just totally uncontrollable. It was just crazy. If I eat breakfast, I would eat for the rest of the day like there is no tomorrow. And especially, it was very interesting. It was porridge oats. I don't know whether you know what it is. This is very, very English thing. <laughs> I, ate it, I, I was made to eat it as a child and I didn't uh, like it. Okay, okay. I love this stuff, unfortunately. And uh, with porridge oats, whenever I eat it, I just, it's like I open the bottomless pit, you know? And I would just eat and eat and eat and nothing satisfies my appetite to the point where my stomach hurts and I still carry on eating. There's something about porridge oats and me and I don't measure things. I don't do all that stuff. But I think what happens is probably my insulin shots up very high and my blood sugar goes sky, sky high, which, which would explain this madness really with porridge oats. So anyway. Going back to the point, the thing with breakfast never worked with me. So I would typically start eating kind of late afternoon and then carry on into the evening. And 
it was almost like a binge eating pattern. And the reason I didn't like eating during the day, because whatever I had, it would bloat me. I had this issue all my life. Like it would bloat me. I feel really uncomfortable. I feel sleepy. And I didn't like feeling like that during the day. So I would kind of stay hungry and drink lots of coffee and then start eating, I don't know, three or four, depending on, on what I'm doing. And then I would eat dinner and carry on snacking. That, that's what I did really all my life. So when I started looking into Jason Fung, um, I kind of went always with him. So I figured out I'm going to eat within two hours and I was pretty strict with that. So it was like proper intermittent fasting. I would eat to satiety and then I would just stop and no snacking. And I can't remember how I arrived to that point, but somewhere along the journey, I also decided to stop eating wheat and sugar. And I for the life out of me, I can't remember what happened in there, but that's that's what I started doing, right? So I go like all guns blazing, intermittent fasting, uh, no wheat, no sugar, and I always been kind of health conscious. I never been a junk food eater, but I would have my moments like all, you know, like I like potatoes, I like rice, I like baking, I love cooking. So I did have some stuff which upset me with the hindsight. So yeah, no wheat, no sugar, cold turkey, intermittent fasting. As the first two weeks, I thought I'm going to die. I had, I just, I was, totally obsessed with food. I couldn't switch off. I couldn't focus on my work. I was constantly miserable. My stomach was grumbling. And I thought, this is torture. I just, this is not life. I, I can't do this, right? But something funny happened. Uh, after two weeks, I realized that my eczema is gone. And uh, eczema is something which I will probably spend the next few minutes talking about because it has been an issue all my life. So I had eczema as long as I remember myself. I have photos of me being really young, like five or six years old in a hospital. And I was born in Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan. And Uzbekistan was part of Soviet Union. Right. So that's where I was born. And I um, lived in there until I was 30 and then I immigrated to UK where I live now and I lived ever since. So uh, my eczema with me all my life and all I remember from childhood, uh, I would be in a hospital and they would inject me and I think what, what they injected was vitamins and also they would take blood from one part of the body and then put it into another part. I Don't ask me Dave, I don't know, I was too young. But that's what I've heard has been done to me to sort out my eczema, right? And then I became a teenager and I started having acne quite bad. And then alongside with all this, it was always my skin. I would have unexplained hives, unexplained rashes. And then I would eat strawberry, which was fine, like five minutes ago. And then I would have massive allergic reaction to strawberry. So I could never really explain, you know, when I look back, there was no pattern to it. I wasn't allergic to any specific things in food. It was just like very ad hoc, whatever. I don't know what was happening. So that stayed with me all my life. Teenage years, periods, no periods, menopause, nothing. I always had my eczema, I always had acne, and I always had these unexplained skin conditions happening. And then with eczema, I think it was pretty damaging on many levels because um, I always cared about the way I look. I got kind of vanity streak in me. <laughs> it's important to me. So I always watch my weight. I like to look good. And, and I think especially when you get older, the way you look reflects how healthy you are. Because I think unless you resort to surgical procedures and stuff. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about natural kind of process of aging. I think the older you become, it almost becomes less about vanity, but more about your state of health, it's state of your skin, it's state of your hair, it's your teeth. And that, that's what kind of makes people attractive or not attractive. So yeah, anyway, so 
and my eczema had quite a damaging effect on my self-esteem because I was quite vain and I like to look good. So, and the reason for that is because it moved, it would kind of plant itself on one part of my body and then it moved somewhere else. And at times I had it like below my waist, which is not very socially acceptable place to scratch. And then uh, I would have it in my armpit. Again, it's a little bit tricky to scratch if you're in a supermarket, you know. And then um, I remember at one point I had it on my back and I was running a group. I was at work and I just kept scratching it and scratching it. And then the guy said to me, are you okay, Zilia? And I said, oh, I just need a bath. So I just laughed it off because I couldn't tell them I've got eczema, you know. And then I remember at one point I had it around my neck and I used to work with ex-military personnel and they're quite crude in their jokes. So obviously there were all sorts of jokes made. So I ended up wearing scarf to cover all that up. So people don't comment on it. And then my last sighting was in my left ear. And that was, it was really miserable because it would get super itchy at night and it was somewhere inside. And I had the feeling that it was inside, inside of my brain and I couldn't reach it. It would just drive me nuts. And few nights I would just stay in bed and cry because I didn't know what to do. And then it would start oozing and the oozing stuff kind of smelled really yucky. So I would stay away from people. So there's all sorts of limitations imposed on me throughout my life with eczema. And I've been, since I came to Britain, I've been under dermatologist for many years. So I had it all, whatever is available in the West, uh, steroid creams, medicated tapes. At one stage, I was put on birth control pills for my acne. And within two weeks, I put on about eight pounds. It was crazy. I couldn't stop eating. So I stopped it. I thought I'm never going to take birth control pills. And then when I was in my 30s, I had about three or four years um, prescription of Rokotan. And this is antibiotic which has got really nasty side effects, one of them being radiation. And also when you take Rakutan, every time they reissue prescription, you have to be tested for pregnancy because if you get pregnant whilst taking this antibiotic, your baby will be deformed mentally and physically. So it's, it's really scary side effects. So yeah. And also coupled with the fact that it was antibiotic, which is not good for your gut, it just wipes it out for years and years and years. Um, so I was put on that medication for about three or four years. And looking back now, I feel really angry about it because I just think it went against all common sense and medical advice. And I don't know, you just don't people, you don't keep people healthy on antibiotics for three years, do you? So yeah, uh, there was all sorts. And then at one point, I actually had eczema in here like in creases and i couldn't open my hand because if i open it it will start crack and bleeding so i kind of spent a few months walking around like that and again there was lots of comments and people say what have you got in your hand anyway so yeah it was quite restricting uh, to live with that so going back to february 2020 i stopped eating wheat and sugar I intermittent fast and two weeks later i realized that my eczema is gone and I just couldn't get over it. And I thought, I, 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 I sleep really well. It's not itching, it's not oozing. I didn't use my steroid cream. So it's got to be something with wheat and sugar. So, and despite I'm feeling so miserable because I didn't have eczema for the first time in my life, it was really liberating. It was just this amazing feeling when you live with disability all your life. And then suddenly it's gone. You don't have to worry about your prescription. You don't have to worry about what if you forget when you go on holiday. It becomes a really miserable thing if you forget your stuff. Can you get close to people because it's oozy again? And sometimes I would lose hearing as well on this side. So it was really, really limiting. So, and it was all gone, Dave, in two weeks. And I'm like, and I think I went through such a mixture of emotions. I felt free. I felt like I'm not a slave anymore. I felt angry about the establishment. I felt lied to because 
I asked many, many doctors, is there something in my lifestyle? Can I be doing something? And the answer was always resounding no. And then actually fairly recently, I was looking at the stuff about eczema on YouTube when I came across this uh, woman, I think she was some sort of healthcare professional. She had this presentation about eczema and she was on and on and on about pharma, about the drugs you need to use and saying that uh, diet really is not that important. It's, sort of, it's all about pharmacological. Th so I lasted for 10 minutes, right? And then I've written her a comment and I said, this is my story. I briefly told her what I've done and how it disappeared within two weeks and how I'm absolutely sure it was wheat because I experimented. I brought wheat back in, my eczema came back, I took it out. So I've done it three times. So I was absolutely sure that it's wheat. So I write all this to her and then I say to her, please don't tell people that diet is not important because it's disempowering and misleading. And you know what she said to me, Dave? She said, eczema is multifactorial. And I'm like, yes, I'm not arguing with that. For some people, it might be multifactorial, but I'm telling you that in my case, it was one factorial, right? It was wheat. And it, it's as valid as any other scientific experiment because this is my life story. This is what happened to me and it might help other people. So please don't mislead. Just give them an option at least saying that I've heard anecdotally that this can help, but she just kind of cut me out, written me this long comment, and I thought, oh, I just give up. I just give up. So I never kind of went back to that. So yeah, there was lots of mixed emotions about this whole thing. And then in this whole journey, I also learned that um, eczema actually is not an external thing. It's autoimmune condition. And that was whole another level of me kind of throwing myself into research and trying to understand what happens in the body. And, and I think the thing is, if you've got autoimmune condition, this is a sign of systemic inflammation in your body. And potentially you are looking for some serious kind of things happening sometime in future. So, and that kind of worried me as well, because I thought I don't want to have systemic inflammation in my body. So, and that's how I stuck with no wheat and no sugar thing, right? After two weeks. So I carried on. Things got much easier after one month. Um, I kind of felt okay. I wasn't like hungry all the time. I was doing well with intermittent fasting. And then I kind of win myself all the sweets, which I didn't think will ever happen. But my problem remained with bread. I just could, I, I used to dream about bread. I would dream about sourdough with French butter. I would dream about rye bread. I would dream about all sorts of bread. And because I like cooking and I, I was really into bread making. So it, I just loved bread. Um, and I think somewhere along the lines, I thought what I'm going to do, I'm going to have it twice a month and see if I can get away with it. And that's what I've done. And I would buy like the best quality I can afford, cut myself three slices, lock the rest in a garage because I just, I've got no control. If there was a bread, I would just eat the whole loaf. So I would lock it in a garage, which is like outside building. So for me to go to the garage, I have to get out of the house in a cold and then open a door and get the stuff from the garage, right? It's ridiculous, really. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I used to do. I would cut myself three slices of bread and then put the rest of the garage or give it to birds or whatever. And that's how I kind of went about bread thing. And then I think maybe two and a half, three years later, I was still not eating sugar, not eating wheat, um, intermittent fasting, all that. Um, I uh, suddenly realized that it's been a couple of months since I thought about bread. And that was another huge milestone for me because I remember saying to somebody, if I ever end up on a death row, I don't know why, but if I do, that my last meal would be like sourdough bread and French butter. I always said that. So for me to realize that I actually haven't thought about bread for two months, it was another kind of milestone and very liberating experience because I could walk past pastry shops and kind of look at it and all I could see is a whole list of nasty things like vegetable oil, 
now, or, you know, that's all I saw really. And it never, it kind of lost its appeal completely. So that was a story with a brat. And then um, I think I got pretty relaxed with carbs as the time went by. And I, I wasn't eating junk. I was eating like rice and potato and sweet potato, stuff like that. So um, I kind of started having it almost on a daily basis. Um, and I still don't know what happened, but my eczema started coming back um, after about three and a half years. I could feel the familiar itching and I thought, no, 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 this can't happen to me. This, I, I'm not having this. Like That was 55 years of misery. So, And I still don't know what happened, whether it was oxalates in the plants or whatever. So, um, And then on 31st of August, I woke up in the morning and I thought, I'm going carnivore. And that's how I ended up in here. <laughs> because I thought the only way I can figure out why it's coming back if I go in on elimination diet. And the ultimate elimination diet is carnivore. So, and here I am talking to you. It's crazy. <laughs> and so that's since the end of August. So how has this journey been for you so far? And, and what kind of things have you noticed? Uh, I went I went all guns blazing as usual. Um, I didn't allow myself anything. I had I have dairy, uh, cheese, um, a little bit of cream, full fat milk with my tea and coffee, just a tiny bit, um, and um, any type of meat really. I like poultry. I like um, guinea fowl. I love duck because it's really fatty. Um, I like bacon. So anything really goat i quite like goat meat so i've been eating meat and um meat and eggs and cheese and you know what um i tried carnivore in the past because once you fall into keto space it's almost inevitable that you come across carnivore isn't it it's like you, you see all the big guns you see anthony chafee and you see ken berry and Paul Mason and Ben Bickman and all the amazing, amazing people in this space. So I kept hearing about carnivore and I was really curious about it because I thought I never tried it. The stuff people talk about is just mind blowing. Like the range of conditions which people can sort out with carnivore, it just, it just boggles my mind. Right. Um, so I was very, very curious about it, but, um, and I tried it for two days and then I would get sick of meat and I think I don't want to eat meat again. And this is what stopped me. So this time on 31st of August, I woke up and I thought, that's it. I'm going carnivore. I said to myself, if I feel sick of meat, I will give it until the next day when I'm hungry. And if when I'm hungry, I still feel sick of meat, I'll stop it. And that's how I did it really. And what I discovered is... Yes, I get sick of meat. I eat it and I just don't want it anymore. And you know, the way you feel satiated on protein and fat is really different from a mixed diet, that it's a really different relationship with, with your body. So, and that, that's how I did it. So every day I eat bacon and eggs or whatever. And I think, Jack, I never want to look at it again, right? I had enough. And then next day I give it an, I, I lately been eating more or less once a day so by the time the 20 hours or whatever hours passed i think actually i can eat some more bacon and eggs so that's that's how i've been doing it day, one day at a time um and i do miss variety uh because i loved cooking and cooking was such a big part of my life i knew how to cook by the age of seven and cooking is all about you know all that stuff in my country in uzbekistan it's all around food. Uh, everything is around food. Like any celebration, if you are feeling great, you eat. If you are not feeling great, you eat. Somebody died, you eat. It, it's everything is around like food and stuff. So that was really difficult. And with that, I was also used to variety. So, and I thought if I fail at this, it would be because of lack of variety. So I started looking on YouTube and I found a couple of recipes which kind of scratched that itch a little bit. So I figured out how to do different things and it still 
still stay carnivore. So that kind of helped me. And another thing, the reason I'm still here, it's because I made this appointment with you that I I knew in the back of my mind that I'll really, really struggle because when I contacted you, I was like seven days into carnival. And I remember thinking, there's no way I can go on with it. I just, I don't want to look at meat again. I want my crunch. I want my this. I want my that. I just, I can't do this. But because I committed myself to you, I thought I don't really want to come to your channel and say, you know what, I feel miserably. I'm eating muffins and cakes and pancakes and whatever. So, yeah, that helped me a lot, actually. Yeah, thank you for that. So, and then, um, because you start noticing things pretty quick, quickly, and I'm not an exception, and I will tell you what I noticed since, since I started this. They're not like massive things, but they're... There's lots of little things which I noticed. So, um, yeah, that's how I've been going about my carnival thing. And I think ultimately where I want to be, I want to get to the stage where I, maybe for a week, I just go on ruminant meat. Because from what I hear from people, it's like a next level. And I really want to experience that. So, but I'm not there yet, and I'm not putting pressure on myself. I'm just kind of stay animal based and meat heavy, and um, and then when I'm ready, I just really want to to do red meat, salt, and water, and and just see what happens. So yeah, that's how I've been doing so far, Dave. So I'm still here, which is pretty amazing. It's been just over six weeks. I never thought I'll last that long, to be honest, but I am. That's awesome. And so just to clarify, there, there's absolutely no eczema now? No, nothing. No eczema. I also started having um, pimples and spots on my face. That was another reason. I thought, no, 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 I'm not having acne again. I'm 59 years old, seriously, right? So those two things really. And another thing which prompted me into carnivore health-wise uh, years ago, I've done something to my knee in a gym. I remember stretching and I don't know, there was something, it kind of cracked. And ever since I had a little bit of an ache on my right knee, it wasn't painful, but it would, I, I just knew that I've got the right knee, right? Whereas I never thought about my left knee. It, it was always, something was always there. So that started coming back as well. Um, and I thought, I don't want to have this knee, whatever thing is going on in there. I don't want to have acne. I don't want to have whatever, eczema. So, yeah. And four days into my carnival, right, something really bizarre happened. And I've heard about it from people on your channel. I had this crazy, crazy splurge of energy because I, I usually am like, I'm not an early person. I struggle to get up early and I just feel resentful if I have to get up early. But I was up like at six, six o'clock and I wasn't just up because I wanted to use a bathroom or whatever. I was properly up. I wanted to get out of the bed. I wanted to get going. And I thought, God, this is crazy. I need to get out of the bed because I can't stay in a bed. <laughs> right? So, and this would happen like every four or five days during first months it was really strange like and i couldn't resist it i had to get out of the bed and get on with life like really early so that happened um and then also another thing which i noticed i always thought that after you have a meal you have to be bloated i thought it's normal and we might probably talk about all this social construct at some stage yeah but it was kind of part of mainstream messaging. You you have to feel sleepy. You have to feel bloated. You have to do this. You have to do that. And I had it all my life. I never had a meal which will leave my stomach alone. I would always kind of feel that my body is digesting. It's bloating. It's gassing. It's, it's just really horrible. Like you're constantly aware of your stomach. And with carnivore, Yes, you get really full, but there's none of that. There's none of that. Your stomach is really calm. It's just full. It's full of meat and it doesn't bother you. And then another thing which I found is I can just go and garden because I love gardening, right? 
and I could go and spend like three hours gardening after eating seven sausages wrapped in bacon, which is insane amount of food, you know? So, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't bother me because I, I think if I had the same amount of calories in a mixed diet, I probably will be like a zombie fight in front of telly. I'm pretty sure I'll have no energy. I would just want to binge on Netflix and just do nothing. But when you eat proteins and fats, your body responds really differently to that. It's almost like it gets recharged and you are ready to go. Whereas if you eat mixed diet, it just messes you up and you just want to sleep or you want to go to the bathroom or you're farting all day yeah. long. You know, it, it's just, yeah. It's, it's a killer, right? And yeah. like, Product, productivity wise, I mean, you eat a mixed diet at, at, towards the end of the day and it's just you're wrecked for the rest of the day, right? Totally, totally. You've got no brain power. You've got no physical power. You just want to be a zombie. It's crazy, really, you know. And, and the thing is, everybody says it's normal. This is what really gets me about this whole mainstream messaging, you know, like um, everything is normal. Being sick is normal. They tell you, we've got special funeral plan if you are over 55. And I think, what is it about the age of 55 that you need to start thinking about funeral? I don't understand it, right? So what is it about women who are post-menopause? Why do they need incontinence parts? You see it constantly on the telly. And you think the message behind all this is that once you pass certain age, you become decrepit and old and incontinent and you need to think about your funeral. And I think this is just so wrong because 55 is young. Like in, in here in England, in Scotland, you get three bus pass if you are 60 and over. And I find it quite insulting because I'm like one year from 60 and I don't want a free bus pass because I want to work until I die. You know, I want to be productive. I want to drive my own yeah. car. I think I'll be the same. Like when, you know, my um, my parents used to live in um, this kind of resort style retirement village, right? And once you get to once you get to fifty years old, you qualify to move into this retirement village. And it was like every time I went to visit them, my dad was like. You're going to qualify to move in here soon. And it's like, <laughs> I don't want to qualify. I don't want to qualify. Yeah, exactly. And I think, like, we are supposed to live until 120, right? People say, right? So if you think that if you are going to live until 120, when you are 50, you are not even halfway through your life. Why are you talking about funeral to me? It just infuriates me, you know? Like, and I think. Alongside with pharma trying to get us hooked early, so you stay customer for life, like a good drug dealer would do, right? And a, and a food industry selling us junk uh, and kind of brainwashing us and making us brain dead, you also get all these messages almost on subconscious level. Like, think about your funeral if you are over 55. And I think, are you all kind of talking together to each other? Do you all sleep in the same bed? Do you like have meetings and decide how to brainwash the population and how to kind of plant this idea that you have to become our customer if you are like over 35? You have to take drugs and you have to become on the receiving end of this, you know, pharmaceutical cascade where you prescribe one drug and then it's got side effects as you need another drug for that side effects. And, and that's how you get hooked and you've got you for life and yeah. you make lots of money, you know? Well, so this is my take on it, and I'd love to know your feedback on this. So when I was growing up, I always, I, I never thought this about the medical industry or the pharmaceutical industry, never thought anything bad, you know, like, obviously, they're a business to make money, but you know, the, they're coming up with the drugs, you know, 100%. It's like, there's no, there's no, you know, bad intent behind anything at all you know they they just they see a problem and they want to solve it right they're actively looking for a cancer cure they're actively looking for a cure for aids all that kind of thing when i was growing up but now when you know being almost 50 i kind of look at um i kind of look at the industries that i've worked in mm. and i kind of think the industries that i've worked in 
they all have moved to a model which is, you know, basically software industries, training, that kind of thing. They all move to this model of if we sell the software once, that's nice. We make some money and we didn't have any overhead anyway, right? Mm. But if we lock people into a monthly fee, then we've got a customer for life yeah. and we make a lot more money that way. You know, and a good example of this is the way Adobe sells their products now, right? Um, and when it, you look at in like just normal businesses operate like that and then you go, well, it makes sense that big pharma would want to lock us in this way and the, the medical profession would want to lock us in this way. You know, yeah, I kind of, I, I'm similar to you because, you know, my interactions with healthcare system, I, I try to stay away. And that's one of the reasons I'm in carnival because I'm absolutely determined mm -hmm. not to be a receiver of whatever goods they're offering, right? But yeah, I think about it quite often. And I think all my interactions with the healthcare system and when my son was growing up, obviously we had to go to doctors. They were all well-meaning people. I've got no doubt about it, right? But, you know, part of me thinks as a doctor or, you know, I'm talking about doctors now, not about the industry. So as a doctor, it is your responsibility to keep yourself updated because the world is changing constantly. And I just cannot see excuse for that. I know you try to be kind and say they're busy people and they've got seven minutes per patient. But I think you've got to take responsibility because ultimately you are responsible for people's lives, right? And it's your responsibility to stay updated. So I kind of don't buy into that. And in a sense of industry, again, you want, you want to be nice to people and say, or oh, maybe they don't know. But again, I don't buy that, Dave. I, I really don't because you only have to go outside and look how people look these days. Most of people look unwell, right? What more evidence do you need? Even if you haven't got time to go to PubMed and look into scientific papers and whatever, just go outside and look look at the state of people. It's it's really horrible. Like it's not very often you see a person who looks healthy nowadays. I, I don't know. You live in Japan, but it's certainly case in England. You know. So yeah, I don't buy it. I think um, it's. Um, yeah, there is definitely deliberate element in all this. Uh, it's a business model. They're just money driven. And that is a really scary, scary thing, actually, because it's almost like if you get in the way of this huge machine, that's it. Unless you've got a willpower and motivation or good people around you to show you other way, you just become victim of this thing and you know i i see it at work dave i've been in mental health for nearly 24 years now and i it's really painful and i also see what's happening to my family members because i grew up in kind of third world country and we ate what's what was in season it was kind of healthy much healthier than western diet uh yeah and Nobody was, I never heard of dementia until I came to England. I was nearly 30. I never knew about the condition. I never seen anybody with cancer when I was growing up. And then I came to England and I saw a load of it. And, and now what's happening? My, I recently went to Tashkent in, in summer and it's, it became super beautiful. It's stunning, stunning city. It's not what I remember. It's not how I left it because I haven't been in 25 years. So it was the first time I went. Uh, it's a it's stunningly beautiful city, but also with all that, there is a, such a influx of fast food, and some of people who are close to me, it really hurt. It really hurt because they're so poorly and they're so in the middle of this system. So I've got it all around me. I see it at my work every day. I see it, people who are close to me. And it's really painful to watch that. And I don't want to become like that, Dave. And I think this, this is probably one of my biggest motivations to stay carnival. 
because it feels like on carnival it feels like i it's almost feels like i'm in harmony with my body that's the only way i can describe it because it doesn't give me any signals mm. like bloating or gas or eczema i don't have any signals from my body that something's not right you know yeah i guess it gives you a feeling of control as well right yeah totally totally and and i think um i guess a bigger picture in all this is that um i feel that lots of things are based on fear mongering and fear narrative and i absolutely detest that because you know i grew up in communist country right so i grew grew up during soviet union and and you know what soviet union was like it was all fear fear based narrative you you couldn't travel and if you did dare to travel you would be scrutinized by certain authorities in in uh, soviet union and yeah there's lots and lots of restrictions like that and it, it was all based in, on fear and then I, I see it again i've seen it in 2020 in the events of 2020 what was all that about dave that was fear-based narrative wasn't it right and pushing pharma propaganda of course um and i think diet is the same you know it's all based on fear you know your cholesterol will go high your kidneys will fail drink eight glasses of water you need fiber and you know the fiber thing actually that's actually worse conversation i think it took me such a long time to get to carnival because i was holding on to the fiber thing right i dealt with wheat i dealt with sugar but because i grew up in a very hot country it gets very hot in uzbekistan in summer and we've got the most amazing produce it's like legendary peaches and melons and watermelons and tomatoes right i always complain about tomatoes and britons absolutely crap in here right because uh, i i <laughs> i was used to really super tasty tomatoes so anyway so and i kind of that was part of my belief system you know vegetables and they're good for you and they're so tasty and we would spend like one month in summer preserving them because we always have eaten what was in season and we didn't have supermarkets and if you wanted to have a cake you have to bake a cake you have to mix butter and sugar and go through all that and then wait for it to bake and then all that so that's how i grew up um so yeah so i kind of couldn't let go of vegetables and fruits for a long time and then i came across this book and i don't know 10 pages into the book i felt like to again they that was kind of a story of my life since 2020 every time i go into something i feel i've been lied to like and where does it end it's like i believed in so many fairy tales and i've got no fairy tales left anymore and the last fairy tale was about fiber right so i came across this book it's called fiber menace and i've heard from this book from sally norton who talks about oxalates and stuff um and 10 pages into the book i thought oh my god oh my god oh my god i feel like i've been lied to and i never realized that bloating which is so normalized everywhere can lead to really serious consequences and the guy he talks about analogy he says imagine a balloon and if you constantly pump air into the balloon what's going to happen to that it's going to get damaged and that's exactly what happens in your gi tract if you are bloated constantly so that that can lead to diverticulitis um ulcers and ultimately to cancer you know and i thought oh my god oh my god i just sat there and i had to put the book down and think I feel lied to, I feel so pissed off, you know, because I kind of held on to that fiber thing. It was like last resort uh, in all this story. So yeah, and I think that probably was a final nail in a coffin. And then there was another nail in a coffin, which was about water, you know, the eight glasses of water story. Yeah, that's another fairy tale because apparently uh, eight, it's seven and a half glasses actually, it's not eight. So we're supposed to have seven and a half glasses of liquid and that includes all the food you eat throughout the day. 
So by the time most people finish eating, they only need two or three glasses of water. So eight glasses can be quite damaging because, um, again, contrary to mainstream message about the color of your urine, they say if it is a light color, it's okay. What the guy says that if it is a light color, it's actually not okay. It's a sign that you are washing out the nutrients and minerals out of your body because it needs to, to be a little bit darker, not, not like straw color. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought, right, this is definitely last last nail in the coffin of a mainstream, right? I don't buy into anything you guys say anymore, right? So, yeah, and that kind of contributed. That was like a last little um, pieces of the jigsaw, how I ended up on Carnival, really. Right. So where does this go for you now? You You plan to stay with Carnival going forward? Uh, yes, I definitely do because um, I I really want to experience mental health side of things because I hear people talking about clarity and more focus and I don't think I'm there yet. I do have bursts of energy and I do feel a little bit karma. Um, I still get wound up on the road, so I still have a bit of a road rage going. So. <laughs> I think I need to stay cardio <laughs> to get rid of that. So yeah, yeah I think like if I, I went I, back to driving, I would go back to having you know being frustrated with people. So I'm not I'm not sure carnival can cure everything. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 okay. So I can cross it off my list. Then. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And I also want to have a bit better body composition because i always had a bit of a soft belly and my belly is actually smaller it's not flat but it's definitely smaller because i don't feel bloated anymore so that that feels really nice and actually people told me have you lost weight and i haven't i haven't lost weight but they say you look like you lost weight so there's something i think my waist waist looks a bit smaller uh, which is why people say have you lost weight so yeah there's Kind of little changes. And you know, something else I really wanted to tell you, Dave, because I never heard anybody mentioning this on this channel. Couple of years into my wit and sugar thing, right? I noticed that when I go past or when I drive past McDonald's or fried food, I feel nauseated and I I it kind of grew stronger on carnivore. I get to the point where i think i'm going to throw up because i find that smell hugely unpleasant and i don't know whether anybody else experienced that and again i i almost feel like i'm in this new relationships with my body so i take it as a signal to stay away from that stuff because obviously it's making me feel sick right for a reason so that that i find really interesting actually um so your body is telling you all sorts of things on a sort of the different senses as well like um i can definitely relate to what lots of people say in here about uh kind of more in sync with the sleeping cycles i i fall asleep earlier and i wake up earlier uh, naturally uh, so i don't like um make an effort i just feel sleepy about 10 30 11 as i wake up early earlier than i used to so yeah, that's something quite noticeable. And I looked into that and I've heard somebody explaining that if you eat ancestrally appropriate diet, your body syncs with the nature. And I thought that makes a lot of sense to me. So that means that my body is happy with whatever I'm putting inside it. So it kind of wants, you know, to go back to natural kind of flow of things so yeah that's it's really interesting the changes i'm observing so yeah yeah that's very nice um so how you mentioned your son what does your son think about your way of eating oh he doesn't care <laughs> he doesn't he really doesn't care he's 28 and he yeah he's aware and i've been nagging him since he was very young about like all sorts of things, right? I, I used to bake bread for his sandwiches, right? So I was I was always into food and stuff. And unfortunately, he's overweight, and unfortunately, he loves junk and and all of that. He was born in England, right? So he's got kind of different mindset to me 
uh, in a way. So, um, and it does worry me. And I would often joke, I'm probably a horrible mother, but I would joke and say to him, um, what crap do you want me to buy for you? And he knows that, you know, and he would say, oh, can you buy me some chocolate? I'm like, okay, I'll buy you something for cancer and diabetes, you know. So, which is probably not a nice thing to say, but I, I'm constantly, constantly kind of, giving messages to him and when I start says mom don't start your health crap I know I shouldn't eat vegetable oil I know mom I shouldn't eat flour so he knows so I'm hoping he's 28 I'm hoping that um he will reach the stage where he will do something about it yeah yeah I I mean everyone's got to get to a point on their own where they're ready right so you know it'll happen it's just a matter of time yeah yeah, hopefully. So, yeah. Yeah. So um if you were giving someone advice about getting started, what advice would you give them? Um I think I would well the way I went about it, it was really important for me to understand uh to understand the reasons behind everything, like why cholesterol? Why should I not be scared about cholesterol, right? Uh, why should I be not scared about not eating fiber? Because we are so brainwashed. And in fact, those are questions I've been faced with because I haven't told many people. But those people who know, one of the first questions was, are you not worried about your cholesterol? Right. So, uh, so I think you need to go through that journey, finding answers for yourself and satisfying yourself that you are not putting yourself in danger because the mainstream is really powerful and it kind of, give you this message that you'll kill yourself right uh, so you need to satisfy yourself that you're not going to die basically and however you do it you know there's lots of ways to do it i went about it by researching and looking into that and um, listening to people who i trust and i think that is important because most of people i listen to they've got personal experience and for me it's almost like a measure of uh, integrity because I know that if the person had the personal experience, he's not taking money from industry. He's not being sponsored by anybody. He's doing or she's doing this because it matters, right? So that's how I went about it. But I guess people are different. And I hear people on this channel talking about um, doing this because I've got serious health issue um, and there was no other options that wasn't my case so um i guess it depends what situation you are in really uh for me it was a lot about curiosity and not wanting to to be what, what i see around me really and you know little niggles as well like sleeping better and and i also always want to know can can i be better version of myself you know that that's an ultimate drive really for me can i do better in productivity can i feel more purposeful can I feel more energy? Can I be more joyful? And can I be more of myself, basically? I think that's that's what I find so interesting about Carnival. So, Delia, is there any way people can reach out to you? Do you have any social media or anything like that? I have got a channel, but it's in Russian. Um, so I kind of put a pause on it because all the stuff I'm interested in, which is all this stuff we talked about, I think it will probably gain more traction in the West, not with Russian speaking countries. That's what I found. So it's in a pipeline, but at the moment, no. But feel free to give my email address uh, to people. I don't mind at all. Yeah. No, no worries. So I'll put your email in the show notes. Delia, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate your time and uh, I hope everything goes smoothly going forward. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.